Good morning, everybody. We're still dealing with our sound system. Hopefully, by the end of the week, we'll have that back at working again. Uh, but good to see everybody. We're going to start off number 619, Take Time to Be Holy. <clears throat> Well, it's on. We don't hear you. Well, you hadn't been hearing me, have you? I mean, I know, but since the sound system's been out, well, I mean, it's on. I'm on. I'm on. See the little light? I'm on. Did we have a little bit of sound Wednesday? Talk louder. <clears throat> Take time to be holy, speak off with thy Lord, abide in him always, and feed on his word. Make friends of God's children. Help those who are weak, forgetting in nothing his blessings to seek. Take time to be holy, the world rushes on. Spend much time in secret with Jesus alone. By looking to Jesus, like him thou shalt be. His friends in thy conduct, his likeness shall see. Take time to be holy, be calm in thy soul. Each thought and each motive Beneath his control, thus led by his spirit to fountains of love, thou soon shall be fitted for service above. Good morning. Good morning. Is mine working? Not working either. Well, good news is on the horizon. Jason has just come in, and I know he'll fix whatever it is. <laughs> Jason, we have no sound whatsoever this morning. So... Okay. So if you're listening over the internet today, let us know if you can hear or can't hear. Because we can't hear here. But good morning. Good morning. It's great to see all of you here today. And um, <clears throat> among the many things I am so thankful for, as a preacher, is sound systems. <laughs> because I just do not have a voice that allows me to project very well. 
And I couldn't, if I didn't have a sound system, then I'm not sure I could actually do this job. But I'm thankful that the Lord has given us that. So many folks, oh, you just look at our bulletin, all the folks that are mentioned there who are struggling with illnesses. And not a good way to end the year or to begin a new one. But let's keep all of them in our thoughts and prayers and try to encourage them the very best that we can. Stephanie and Bill, of course. Uh, West, Stephanie's having a lot of issues. Um, and um, along with it, Bill isn't enough to deal with. So keep them in your prayers. Uh, the granddaughter of Faye Yates, Jenna Spear Sears, excuse me. Keep her in your thoughts and prayers. Linda uh, Cawthorn, the wife of Chris, is going to have surgery next week uh, to remove a mass. Judy Foster, I understand, is she was in taking the hospital? Is she at home or coming home? Okay, hoping she'll be able to come home today or tomorrow, uh, which is good news for her. Uh, continue to remember um, Sandra Molina's grandson, Arrow. He's continuing with uh, fever. Good to see the Charlie and Don back today. <laughs> Let me see that again. So, is that a volunteer orange color? No, that's right. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can fix that, you know. <laughs> Have some orange paint. But glad to see they're over the crud, at least, I hope. And uh, he has a, a cast on his hand, and boy, Charlie, glad it wasn't more serious. Um, could have been, could have really been bad. Uh, keep Colleen quick in your prayers. Bless her heart. Colleen, back in the summer, um, we didn't really announce this or make any, any news about it, but she was, Jerry and I prayed on her behalf then. She was really concerned about her health at that point, and we thought, she went to the doctor and Doctor gave her a clean bill of health. We thought, and uh, so this is just kind of, you know, tragic to hear her having this issue. But continue to remember her, and that she might be able to recover after that stroke. Uh, Betty Gooch, of course, um, who is in Hickory Hills under uh, hospice care, the mother uh, 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 and mother-in-law of Jerry uh, and, and Melinda Maxwell. Keep Butch Stokes in your prayers as well as he begins his cancer treatments. Karen Davis also uh, as well. Um, and so many others. Just go down the list there. Um, I can't help but not mention, um, I know he's listening because he always does, uh, Brother Dan Collins. And I just, oh, uh, we really, I really wish he could get the help he needed and be back with us. Uh, he could be such an asset to the church here. So let's continue to pray on his behalf and also... <laughs> <laughs> also Lois she's helpful too but especially Dan no, I'm kidding keep Lois in your prayers thoughts and prayers also um, also uh, Marlene Stover and her difficulties as well are there others folks that we need to mention that I'm forgetting that I want to need to make a note of today How's the Watts family? <laughs> They've gone through. The Watts family is one of those families that would be glad to see 24 behind them. I mean, 23 behind them, right? Yeah. And so many issues and struggles this past year. I'm sorry? Joe and Debbie White. Okay. Are both got spread. Oh, okay. Joe and Debbie White uh, have... Their, their turn yeah. <laughs> at the crud. Yeah. So keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Anyone else? I could tell Joe was having a little trouble singing, leading singing. He was, I think he was already coming down with a little. little oh boy. All right, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for all the many blessings that you give us. We thank you for the gift of life. We thank you for this past year, for being with us and helping us and 
We thank you, Father, as we look back on the past year that you've been with us as we went through a merger between two congregations and that, Father, you've allowed us to come together in such peace and harmony and and we just pray you'd continue to be with us in this coming year that we can grow together as your people in this community, in this area, to do your will. We thank you, Father, for for being with us and so many people who have been sick that you've helped to get well. You you, you brought brought them back to us again. We thank you for them. But Father, we know we have so many other folks who are still sick, struggling. And Father, we just pray your blessings upon them that they all might be healthy and well once more, have many more good and happy days ahead of them. Bring them back to us. We need them here with us, Father, working in this community. Father, we thank you for the opportunity today to come together and worship you. We thank you for your son that makes possible the life that we live now and the possibility of eternal life one day. And we just pray you would help us to take advantage of our opportunities to grow, to become what you would have us to be. And um, Father, we, don't, we want to be with you in eternity in heaven and just help us to bring that about. Thank you for the, the opportunity today to study your word and to worship you. And we pray that you'd be with us in this endeavor that all that we do and say may be pleasing to you. And all things may or will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. Solomon once said, And further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end. And much study is is wearisome to the flesh. I'm sure there's a name for people who who collect books and read books. Bookaholic, maybe. Oops. It's not mine, is it? Did you hit that? Did you hit a button? If you've been to my... It was you? Oh, thank you for coming to my rescue. <laughs> so how many people in here hit your button when you <laughs> heard that go off? <laughs> oh, okay, well, I, I do that all the time. It'll be in my pocket and I'll bump up against something and it'll... Okay, so Solomon said of making of many books, there is no end, and study is a wearisome to the flesh. And I don't know if you've ever, if you've been back to my office here now, you'll notice <laughs> Florida ceiling books. And I had to put some in boxes. I couldn't get them out. And uh, we left, when we left Union City, we left so many boxes of books that were there. You might just collect books, you know, sometimes. And people ask me, and oh, they always want to know, have you read all these? And of course, I'm, yeah, I've read every one, twice. No, not really, of course. <laughs> but you know, when you start thinking about all the books that are in the world and all the possibilities, I don't know if you've ever read that statement from Solomon, but what's really insightful to me is the very next verse. He says, And further, my son, be admonished by these of making many books, there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. And then he says, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It's like he's trying to tell us that for all the knowledge and all the books in the world, ultimately, There's only one that matters. The only thing that matters is doing God's will. And all those other books that we have and we read and we spend time on are... I remember, I'm pretty sure I read some time ago that Alexander Campbell at the end of his life said, if if I had to do it over again, 
I would just read, I would just read this book. Concentrate on that. Campbell was a prolific reader, of course. They say if you went into his office, he had books stacked everywhere. I'm not sure exactly that that's something I would agree with, but I understand what he's saying. I read something by uh, John Stott one time, a well-known uh, evangel evangelical preacher. And he said the preacher ought to be informed about what's going on in the world, and that really requires that he read some other things. And I can kind of see that point of view also, but... I know what Campbell was trying to say. We spend so much time in superfluous, unimportant stuff. But that's the thing that's going to get us to heaven. This book. That word Bible literally means book. But it's a holy book. A holy Bible. And it gives every indication of being divine in its origin and coming from God. It's marvelous unity, as everybody will tell you, written by 40 different men over 1,600 years. It's scientific and historical accuracy. It's prophetic fulfillment. It's claims of divine origin. The Bible is unlike any other book in any other library that's ever been written. It stands alone in its uniqueness. It answers life's most difficult questions. Where do we come from? Where did our universe begin? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1, verse 1. Why am I here? Ecclesiastes 12, verse 13. This is the whole of man. Literally, this is the whole of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's why we're here. And where am I going? These shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 25, verse 46. Someone put it this way. The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the happiness of believers, and the doom of sinners. It's been called a law book. It's become popular in the last few years to call it the love letter. And it's both of those and everything in between as well. I try to get people every time for years now, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of standard with me. Sometimes towards the end of the year, you're going to get a lesson on the Bible and how important it is. And it, because I believe that. And, and I, for years now, I've tried to get people every year, read your Bible. It's so important to you. And I've had folks come up and tell me, you know, this, I read my Bible this year for the first time. Wouldn't have done it without your encouragement. I've had other people who read their Bibles regularly to say, yeah, I've been reading my Bible and I've done it more than ever because of your encouragement. And, and I think that's, man, that's so important. I wish I could get everybody to understand how important this book is so they'd read it and study it. So I thought today, I'd just talk to you a little bit about the Bible and maybe give you a little greater appreciation for what it is and how it can change your life for the good and for the better. The Old Testament, of course, was a book written in Hebrew, we know. Probably began as an oral tradition back in those ancient days when you had patriarchs and they didn't have the Bible written down, so they passed it on orally from person to person. And that some people would say, well, you know, if that's the case, then how do we know it's accurate? They could have so many people. You mean you pass something along a while to all these different people that gets changed, right? But if you add up the ages of the folks that lived in those days, 900 and something years, you know, so Adam could have passed on information about the beginning to his great, 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 great grandson. And he, who lived 900 years, could have passed it on to his great, 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 great grandson. So it only had to go through two or three people to get to the time of Noah, and only a few people then to Moses. So it's not really that difficult to think about it being something that gets passed on orally. Of course, we believe God's hand was also in that whole process, right? 
But eventually it came a point where Moses said, you know, we really need to write this down because other people are going to want to know what God's Word says. And so in the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 17, verse 18, he's specifically talking about the king here. He says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priest and the Levites. Write him a copy. By the way, you want to come to know God's word better? Try writing a copy for yourself. It works. I was reading the other day about You may have seen it on, I'm getting off a little here, but um, I think it was on US, it was on uh, Fox, the internet version of Fox. Anyway, it was telling, this preacher was telling about how he memorized the Bible. And he knew great sections of it, great, you know, several books he had memorized. Well, that always gets my interest. And so he told about how to do this, and he said, well, one of the things you have to do is you need to read it out loud to yourself. Secondly, you have to listen to it. You're getting all your senses involved. And then he said, you need to write it. Because now you've got hearing and seeing and writing, and it's all the whole thing, and and you're beginning to learn it that way. And then he He also said this, which I thought was really interesting. He said, if you memorize one verse a day, then in a year you know a whole book of the Bible by memory. Have you ever thought about that? (laughs) So in about 20 years, you know 20 books by memory. Wouldn't that be great? Anyway, sorry for the sidetrack there. So we believe Moses penned the first five books of the Bible it's often, he's often said to be the author. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 14, for instance, the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Write it down in a book. In Numbers 33, in verse 2, Moses wrote these, their goings out according to their journeys by the commandment of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their goings out. So he wrote them down. So we believe that Moses gave us those first few books, and others lend support to this view. The Lord himself viewed Moses as the author. In Luke 24 and verse 44, it's called the Law of Moses. And in John 7 and verse 19, did not Moses give you the law, he said. And others wrote, after Moses, of course, there was Joshua, chapter 24, verse 26. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak. So he wrote down God's words for us. Samuel wrote, 1 Samuel 10, verse 25. Samuel told the people the manner of the kingdom and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And of course, many of the other prophets also are said to have written what we now have. In Jeremiah chapter 36 and verse 2, God says, Take thee a roll of a book, and write therein all the words that I have spoken unto thee against Israel, and against Judah, and against all the nations. From the day I spake unto thee, from the days of Josiah, even unto this day. Write it in a book. At some point, of course, all of these writings from the different prophets had to be, and the different authors had to be put together. And we don't know exactly, but we think maybe Ezra. Ezra, of course, who came along towards the very end of the Old Testament period, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, they come back from Babylonian captivity. And so we think maybe Ezra then collects all of these Old Testament books about 400 years before the time of Christ and puts them together. You may have heard, I know the name Josephus. You've heard the, the Jewish historian. And Josephus said, quote, no book was added to the Hebrew scriptures after the time of Malachi. And so whatever we have as a part of the Old Testament, by the time of Malachi, it was together and got passed on. Alexander the Great, of course, we know about him, conquered the then-known world. And with that conquering, brought the Greek language to everyone, which was, I think, one of the most providential things God did because he made it possible for people everywhere to hear the same word in the same language, right? It's kind of like, English today, everywhere I go, you find somebody that speaks English, 
and knows that language. And so he conquered the world and he took Greek everywhere. So about 227 B.C., before the time of Christ, the Greek scholars, about 70 of them in Alexandria, took the Old Testament scriptures and wrote it in Greek. We call that the Septuagint version of the scriptures. And, and it's great, very important because it allows us to take the Hebrew Bible and then we look at what the Greeks thought the word should be and we can see what the Greek language, how the word that it equated with a Hebrew word. And it helps us gain insight into the meaning of the word and, and understand what the Bible is trying to tell us. So we run across a Hebrew word and we say, oh, well, that's just like this Greek word. And that's what it meant. And so it gives us great understanding into God's word. That word, version, by the way, was the version used in the time of Christ. And so it's not unusual to find one of, the, prof, one of the, the apostles in the New Testament quoting from that Septuagint version. And we, sometimes they, they give by inspiration their view of what the Hebrew writer was saying. And sometimes they give a quote from the Septuagint version, the Greek version of the Old Testament. Well, the New Testament, of course, also was written in Greek. It was written after the death of Christ. 33 A.D. to 96, and in fact, more generally from about 50 A.D. to 100 A.D. Both Testaments, both the Old and the New, contain a little Aramaic, and Aramaic was kind of the common Hebrew language of the day. And so probably the one the disciples more often spoke in. The authors were mostly Jewish men, of course, with, from a variety of backgrounds. Some were fishermen. There was a doctor. Who was that? Luke. A tax collector, Matthew, Matthew yes, and um, fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, John, um, a theologian, <laughs> Paul, sat at the foot of Gamaliel and learned the scriptures. So they wrote for different reasons, of course, but they, I think one of the things that gives us evidence of the Bible being the word of God is that so many different people from different backgrounds could could so unanimously agree on what God is trying to tell us and gave us such a unified document. The first four volumes we know, of course, were written as the, about the life of Christ, the Gospels. Luke chapter 1, Luke starts off his Gospel by saying this, For as much as many have taken in hand to set in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us, even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of those things wherein thou hast been instructed. He wrote so we can know for sure about Jesus Christ. Much of what Paul wrote was written in response to questions that people ask. It's always helpful, I think, to remember that, because when you, when you read a book, it's helpful to know, why, why was he writing this? It helps me understand the whole purpose here and what he was trying to say. And Paul often wrote to address an issue. If you can figure out what the issue is he's addressing, then you, you begin to understand, okay, this is what he was, he's trying to say here. I like 1 Corinthians because 1 Corinthians begins with Paul saying, well, I've heard this, <laughs> and then he responds to what he heard. And I heard this, and then he responds to that. And then you get on about chapter 7, he says, okay, so regarding what you asked me about this, and then he begins to answer the question of they, what they ask. So the scriptures were really given from the perspective of trying to answer questions and problems. But you know what? People don't change, do they? So we have the same questions that they had. And we, they, if we just go to God's word, we find the answers that we're looking for. Because it gives us those, that response. John wrote his first epistle. He says, so that our joy might be full. 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, we can know with certainty. I love John because, 1 John, because it's all about knowing with certainty what you believe. And that does bring us joy. And others wrote, to give encouragement and confidence and instruction and hope and things related to living the Christian life. At first, eyewitness testimony regarding Christ was available. You could, people didn't need a scripture. They, everybody was, they were still around. We saw him. We know what he did. But they knew the time would come when those eyewitnesses would no longer be available. They also had spiritual gifts in the first century, of course, and one of those was the ability to speak God's word plainly. 
prophesy, which is just another way of saying to be able to speak for another, to speak God's word, was one of the spiritual gifts. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, chapter 12 through 14. But the time would come when the spiritual gifts would end. Our witnesses would be gone. And so there needed to be a preservation of that for future generations. So John says in chapter 20, verse 30, Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and believing you might have life through his name. I wrote these down so you could come to believe in Jesus. And Peter, in 2 Peter 1, in verse 12, says, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. Yeah, I think it meet as long as I'm in this tabernacle to stir, up, stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that you may be able, after my decease, after I'm dead, to have these things always in remembrance. How are you going to do that? By writing them down. <laughs> For we have not followed cunningly devised fables, when we may not unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Well, from the first, I think New Testament writers understood and recognized that what they were writing was God's inspired word commandments that we could keep it's interesting to note how many times in his letter to the corinthians that paul talks about this about his writing being from the lord and you should keep this because these are the commandments of the lord and for instance in first corinthians 14 verse 37 if any man think himself to be a prophet if you've got that spiritual gift that allows you to speak god's word by inspiration if there's anybody there who thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. This is what God commanded us. It's not optional. Well, Paul wanted his letters read to other congregations as read as well because they understood the importance of that word being distributed. Colossians 4, verse 16. When this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from the Laodiceans. So their plan was for this word to be written down, distributed to us. People would be able from different places to read the different letters and understand God's will. At some point, of course, these were all collected together into one New Testament book. Over the ensuing years, councils met by, as men are always likely to do, right, to try to figure out, hmm, should this really be in there? I think it's important to, to observe that they're, they were never meeting to try to, under, to try to figure out what ought to be put in, but whether or not something that was recognized as a part of the Scripture should be taken out. And they ended up, when all was said and done, now nah, this is what it is. This is what we have, and no reason to take that out. So when you think about it, the Bible has been challenged, it has been critiqued, it's been investigated, it's been attacked more than any other book in existence, and yet it's still the same Bible. It's never changed. It's God's word to us, and we accept it as that. Can we be sure it's accurate? Boy, I'm running out of time in a hurry. Well, I think we can. It's much older, of course, than printing, and uh, it's much older. It, it, it dates back to the time when they had to use uh, Papyrus, which as you know is made from uh, papyrus plants that have been stuck together in, in a form of paper. And some of them were put on leather parchments. The problem with those, of course, they didn't last. And so they decayed. And they, uh, they are no longer with us, so we don't have any original copies anymore. And that bothers some people. They say, we don't have any copies. Why we've got copies? How do we know it's right? And it's accurate. Well, first of all, I would say to those who think that way, you've got to remember, the people who wrote and who copied the scriptures and gave us all the copies that they did, these weren't people trying to corrupt God's word. These were people, people who were bending over backwards to make sure they gave us just exactly what God's word said. They wanted, didn't want to corrupt it. They were doing everything they could to make sure it was accurate. And so you need to keep that in mind to, to begin with. They were trying to preserve its accuracy. Um, but I think, secondly, you need to, um, if you think about it, 
and you go back and look and study all of the, the different uh, copies that you have. We have, I don't know if you're aware, somewhere I read like 25,000 different copies or parts of the New Testament. A lot of them. Um, and you, you begin to look at all the copies. You know what you discover? Not much difference. Not any doctrinal difference. And not much difference at all. In about 1946, there was a great discovery ma made. They discovered in a cave near the Dead Sea what we now know as the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what they were was they were part of the Old Testament that had been copied. They dated from about 70 to 150 B.C. before the time of Christ. And, and so they get, it's the oldest copy we ever had of the Old Testament. And they went back and they started looking. And they said, you know what? Not much difference. We thought there'd be a lot of changes. Nope. Same thing. Um, on top of that, you have the writings of about 40 different church fathers, church leaders over the ages from the first and the second century who quote freely from the New Testament. And you begin to go back and some, some people have said you could almost write the New Testament just from the quotations of these ancient uh, fathers, quote unquote. And what they do is they show the accuracy of what we already have, the New Testament. And of course, in the fourth place, we ultimately have to trust the accuracy to the guiding hand of God, right? I mean, God wants us to be saved. And so he's going to give us a word that's going to be able to do that. And God's word is like that. He's preserved that for us. In 1 Peter 1, verse 23, Peter says that we're born again, not of corruptible seed, but of, of incorruptible, but by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. All flesh is as grass, all the glory of man is the flower of grass, the grass withereth, the flower there falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So that should give us great confidence that what we have is in fact God's word to us. Well, I'm running out of time, but let me, I want before I leave to make sure again you understand just how important this document is to us. And we could spend a long time just looking at passages that tell us what it does for us to read and study the Word of God. You want something to guide you in life? The Word of God, right? Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my pathway, Psalms 119, 105. You need something that will keep you from sinning against God. Well, I do. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. Psalms 119, verse 11. You want something to instruct you in God's way, to help you to become the child of God he wants you to be? That from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise into salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. Thoroughly or completely furnished unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, verses 15 and 16. How can I be purified in a world so full of impurity? God's word, seeing you have purified your soul in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 Peter 1 and verse 22. That word of God frees us, John 8, 32. It saves us, James 1, 21. Let apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, overflowing of naughtiness, receive with meekness the engrafted word, it just means implanted, the word of God implanted in your heart, the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. That's important, right? Isn't that what we want? If God's word is able to guide me, to light my path, to keep me from sin, to instruct me, to purify me, to free me, to save me, why on earth would I not want to read God's word all the time? We believe that word of God is complete and total. The disciples were promised that God, that the Lord would, the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth, John 16, 13. Paul declared the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, verse 27. And John wrote all that we needed to come to believe in him, John 20, verses 30 and 31. 
In fact, Peter says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. God's word is important, and it's that word that one day we're going to have to give an account for, to answer for. John 12, verse 48. Jesus said, He that rejecteth me, receiveth not my word, hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. So God's word is important to us. I can't tell you how much, I can't overemphasize how important it is. I don't know if you've been reading God's Word on a regular basis and studying God's Word on a regular basis, but if you haven't, you are missing out on the most important thing you can do in 2024. Read the Word of God. So I hope you think about that and decide maybe to make that more a part of your life on a daily basis. My time, I think, is up. So let's end with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us, for the opportunity to come here and think about your word. We thank you so much for giving us that word to guide us in life. We just pray you would help folks to understand what it can do for them and help, help us all to make that a, a part of our lives every day, to come to know you and your will for us and do those things that are pleasing in your sight. All of these things, Father, we ask in your Son's most holy name. Amen. This thing never rolls for me. A bibliophile is a collector. Bibliophile, oh. <laughs> I should have asked, I should have just asked you right up front.
attention, please. I tried to get someone else to do this, but they refused. They didn't have confidence in you like I do. Our sound system is today, it's not working. So if you want to hear, you know how soft-spoken I am, unless I'm mad at my wife. Otherwise, though, if you want to hear what we're saying, you might want to consider moving up this away some. I've got confidence. They didn't think you would, but I know better. So those of you who are interested in learning more about God's Word, Those of you who are serious about your Christianity, and I'm really getting to you now, move up here a little bit. Okay, that's my speech. Hmm. And the farther you come forward, the softer the seats are. It's working. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made, I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. coming apart up here. <laughs> Welcome to Radnor. Happy New Year's Eve. Uh, we have just a few announcements. Most of them are in the bulletin. So get you a bulletin and, and read them. It'll be easier than trying to yell over all this. Stephanie and Bill West have been very sick lately. Keep them in your prayers. Jenna Sears, granddaughter of Faye Yates, has high blood pressure. She's pregnant. We've been through this. We know what this is. They're hoping she can hold off with the baby for two more weeks. Keep her in your prayers. Judy Foster is at Southern Hill to flu and AFib. Charlie Parrish is back today, which is good. Betty Gooch, the mother of Melinda <coughs> Maxwell, is at Hickory Woods under hospice care. <coughs> Butch Stokes is beginning a new cancer treatment. I've been asked to read this letter, or this note. It says, thank you to my adopted family at Radnor. You've been so kind with your thoughts, cards, and food. But most of all, prayers when I was ready to, when I was ready to give up. I felt everyone. God has a plan for me. I'm not through yet. Can't wait to see what it, what it is. And it is signed, Sheila Jackson. This will be hung up in the, on the bulletin. Let's worship God in, in truth, spirit and truth. Thank you. It's the bench's fault. 
number 238. Holy, holy, holy. <clears throat> holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all and blessed eternally. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the crystal sea. Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who washed in art and evermore shall be. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see, only thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall Praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God over all and blessed eternally. Let us pray. Dear Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day. Thank you for allowing us to wake up and experience the things that, that you have made plans for, leading us and guide us today. We thank you for watching over us as we gathered here. We thank you for the love and grace that you've shown us through all our years. We want you to bless those that were not able to be here. Go with them and stand by them. Let them know that you're still with them. Continue to watch over us and bless us with the message and let the message be something that we take to our hearts and minds and lead us and guide us through the coming year. We thank you for allowing us to make it this year. We thank you for the blessing that you've stored upon us. We're asking you to keep, going, keep us going, keep us lined up, keep leading us and guiding us we, for your love your grace and mercy lives forever. We're so thankful. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who you sacrificed on the cross for our sins. We ask you to forgive us for our sins and continue to watch over this church, continue to let it grow. We want you to bless the message, open up our hearts and minds so that message can take heart and lead us and guide us through the next coming days. These and other blessings we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In preparation for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing number 359, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross, verses 1 and 4. <clears throat> 
Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. Near the cross I'll watch and wait, hoping, trusting ever, till I reach the golden strand. Just beyond the river, in the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river. One of my favorite Bible passages in, from the New Testament is the story of uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch and how he met that man and the eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53 about Jesus and he didn't really understand the passage and Philip explained that to him and often I think of Isaiah 53 during the communion service. That's just where I center. So we'll read this morning for just a minute from Isaiah 53, beginning at verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for this bread. For us, it represents the body of your Son nailed to the cross. And we think about the indignity and the shame that was piled on him and the suffering. And we thank you for his obedience and his love. And we thank you for his resurrection. And we pray that the things we think about while we eat this bread will please you. In Jesus' name, amen. And our Father, we also thank you for this cup. And for us, it is Jesus' blood 
shed on that cross. His very life poured out like a sacrifice for each of us. And again, we pray that the things that we think about while we drink from this cup will please you as we remember the death, the burial, the resurrection of your son. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's pray one more time. Our Father, you've given us every spiritual blessing, and we thank you for that. And we also thank you for taking care of us in this world with all the physical blessings that you give us. We thank you that we were able to give back this morning, and we pray that you will bless the expenditure of that money that will honor your name and spread the gospel here in Nashville. In Jesus' name, amen. This is a special day for us. 12, 31, 23. Or if you prefer, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. I read the other day that the county clerk was uh, overwhelmed with the number of applications from people wanting to be married. They want to be married on 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. The real reason is because that way, I think it was actually the wives, they would know that their husbands would never forget their anniversary. You have to be careful. Wives can be deceptive and deceived. We know that, right? It's a great day because it's the last day of 2023, and for some of us, that's a day to rejoice, right? But that year is behind us. But I think, of course, for us as the people of God, it's a special day today because it's the day we get to come together as the family of God and worship Him. Remember, as we just did, what great sacrifice was made on our behalf and to express to Him our worship, our appreciation by the way we come together. I always think it's important to begin a study of God's Word with a prayer. So will you pray with me once more? Our Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given us, for the opportunity we've had so far to worship you. And, and now once more as we worship you in the study of your Word, help us, Father, for just a few moments to put from our minds things of this earthly scene. It's, we know there's something vastly more important here, and that's preparing ourselves for eternity. Help us to understand your will for us and And grant us that great ability to apply your word to our lives. These things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Have you ever tried to define the term time? I don't want to lose you, so don't do it right now. But when you get home later today, you don't have anything to do, you're watching the clock 
the year comes, try to figure out what's a good definition for time. I got curious, and so I went to the source of all knowledge, Wikipedia. And here's the definition they gave. <clears throat> time is the continued sequence of existence and events that occurs in an apparently irreversible succession from the past to the present and into the future. It is a component quantity of various measurements used to sequence events to compare the duration of events or the intervals between them and to quantify rates of change or of quantities in material reality or in the conscious experience. Time is often referred to as the fourth dimension. Did you get that? So if you understood that, then you deserve a Nobel Prize. What I found more insightful was the definition that I found later on down in that, pair, in that article. <coughs> Quote, defining time in a manner applicable to all fields without circularity has consistently eluded scholars. <laughs> in other words, they can't define time. Nobody's figured out how to do that yet. Time is hard to define, isn't it? Someone defined time as simply being the space between two eternities. That makes more sense to me. We know that time began right in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And time will come to an end when that last day comes. The day when the, the earth shall pass away. The day of the Lord cometh when He cometh as a thief in the night. 2 Peter 3 and verse 10. But I think we can be even more specific than that. For us, time is the, the day that we came into this world. From that point until the day that we leave this world. You see, there is no time beyond the grave. Time is only a function of here, of this lifespan that we have. With the Lord one day is a thousand years, Second Peter 3 and verse 8. It's, he doesn't have any clock that he goes by. But I want to suggest another definition for you to consider. That time is that which makes change possible. And the more time, the more change. A few seconds, not much change. But if I've got a lot of time, a lot of change can occur, right? Most of us have experienced that in our lifetimes. We've seen all of the changes that have occurred in our world. Now, there's some changes, of course, that we don't have much control over, like growing old. But there are some changes we do have control over. I know you've all heard and remember that prayer we call the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Some things we cannot change, but, but my challenge this morning to all of us as we enter into a new year is to think about changing the things we can change and, and becoming what we ought to really be becoming, a children of God. Some things, of course, are just simply beyond our control. The Bible speaks of this reality, I think. Remember Jesus said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt, where thieves break through and steal. Some things are just, they're going to decay. We don't like that, but it is what it is. Our houses grow old. Our cars, everything we have on this earth grows old, decays and vanishes eventually. The Hebrew writer was talking about Jesus in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 11. He said, They shall perish, this earth, the things of this earth shall perish, but thou remainest, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture thou shalt fold them up, and they shall be changed. 
but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. And deep down, most of us don't really like that, do we? We don't want things to change. We want them to be like they always were. I'm not going to show, ask for a show of hands, but how many of you over the Christmas holidays, I, I would be willing to bet most of you at some point said something like this. Well, I remember those Christmases way back when this or this happened. I remember that gift I got when I was a child. And that, I remember when we all used to have this gathering at, at, at Grandma whatever's house. You, know, you were reminiscing about the past and you liked those days. You wish you could go back. But things have changed. Most of you, again, I'm not going to embarrass anybody by asking for a show of hands, but how many of you are sitting in the same place you sat in last week? And the week before? And the week before? And I can just about, without even looking, tell you who's sitting where. Because that's where you always sit. We don't like to change, do we? And you probably went to the same routine this morning to get ready for church that you did last week and the week before. And after church, you'll probably go do the same thing you did last week. And we're people that get into these ruts. We don't like change. But change is an inevitable part of life. Things happen. And unfortunately, we have to change. And sometimes the change is good change, right? Some of the changes in the medical field have made it possible not only to sustain life, but make life better for us. We've experienced some of that. Some of the technological advances that we have today. Our microphones <laughs> which don't work this morning. <laughs> but those are good things, right? It's supposed to make life easier for us, although sometimes just the opposite, I think. But the biggest change for all of us, and the one that most of us really don't like, is what we see when we look in the mirror. The change that's happening to our bodies. We are aging. We are growing older. Time is affecting us. I know you've heard Ben Franklin, oh Ben Franklin's statement, in this life the only thing certain are death and taxes. Right? It comes to that point in life when we know what lies before us Nothing's going to stop it. We have an appointment with it. Hebrews 9, verse 27, with death. Paul spoke of this inevitable change that occurs to us, but he also spoke in a positive way that at the same time this was happening, something else was possible in a more positive way. Listen to this passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 16. For which cause, he says, we faint not, but though our outward man, this body, our outward man perish. For him, maybe persecution, maybe growing old, maybe something else. Though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is made new. Day by day. Isn't that a positive way of looking at it? Yeah, the old, I'm wearing out and I'm growing old, but boy, the new part of me. Every day can be better. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, temporary. But the things which are not seen are eternal. We can't stop the change that's happening to us physically, unfortunately, but we can change what happens to us internally and the kind of people that we become and how we grow and, and develop. And that's my challenge to us this year, to think about how you can change inside and how we can be better. You know, God wants that of us. God wants us to change. I don't know how you can read through the scriptures and see all of those verses and not realize 
God wants you and me to change for the better. 2 Peter 3 and verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow. Or 2 Peter 1 and verse 5. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, knowledge temperance, temperance patience, patience godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness charity. Add. Keep on adding. Keep on growing. Developing. The Hebrew writer in chapter 5 and verse 12 rebukes them because they ought to be teachers and they're still needing somebody to teach them. And they come down to chapter 6 and he says, therefore leaving these first principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Grow up. You need to change. Don't be complacent. Don't mean happy with where you're at. God wants us to be better. In fact, one of the things we know from Scripture is God's Never been happy with complacency, has he? Remember the layout of sins, Revelation 3? Made God sick. The, Hebrew, the Hebrews, we just spoke of them in chapter 5 and verse 12. You need to grow up. Why aren't you able to teach instead of having people to teach you? God wants us to change. And we, it bothers us when we're not because we know we're letting God down to begin with. But I don't know about you, but I also get discouraged when I'm not growing because I can't figure out why. You ever felt that way? I've been a Christian for a pretty good while. I'm still doing the same dumb things I always did. Why haven't I changed? Why haven't I got better? Why, haven't I, why am I not able to resist those temptations that I, I'm still struggling with those? Why is that? I don't understand. You ever felt that way? I posted some pictures on Facebook of uh, my, Denise and I on our trip, anniversary trip. And one of my Facebook friends, who happens to be somebody I've known from high school, I don't know why she put this on it. She said, You're the same old Jeff. Or something to that effect. The same old... What did she mean by that? I wanted to ask, what in the world do you mean by that? I hope that's not true. My stars, I hope that's not true. I hope I'm not the same. I hope I'm different from those high school days. Don't you hope that? That you've grown some, you've developed more, you've become something different. For me, one of the scariest passages in the Word of God is the one in Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. I think I may have mentioned this to the Wingate folks, but listen to this. God tells Jeremiah, Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Boy. Can a man change the color of his skin? Can a leopard change it, the color of its, you know, from the spots it has? No. And so God is saying, it's just as likely you have been doing this sinful stuff all your life, you're going to change. Isn't that, doesn't that scare you? the possibility that I might not be able to change for the better. When you think about where you are now to where you are back, where you were back at the first of this year, are you better? Are you serving God more? Are you more dedicated and committed? Have you been reading His Word? Have you grown in your knowledge and your faith? How have you changed? And what will happen to you in 2024? At the end of 2024, will you be different than you are now? Or will you be the same? 
Ebenezer Scrooge had to see the spirit of the past and the present and the future before he would ever finally make a change. What will it take for us before we really make a change and be what the Lord wanted us to be? That haunting song by Ruth Carruth comes to mind. Swiftly we're turning life's daily pages. Swiftly the hours are changing to years. How are we using God's golden moments. Shall we reap glory? Shall we reap tears? The thing is, this change, if it's ever going to occur, it's up to us, isn't it? We determine whether or not we grow and how we become like the Lord. And let me interject very briefly and quickly here. The Lord has, has some hand in this as well, right? Right? Those difficulties you face in life, the adversities, I think that's one way God helps us to grow. I mean, isn't that what James says, chapter 1, verse 2, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, many kind of trials, knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, perseverance. But the patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. You come to be perfect God is using His adversities to make you strong, to make you grow. But we don't have much choice about those. They come into our life. The only choice we have is how we react to them. The same sun that melts wax, hardens clay, depends on how we react. I'm talking about this morning the things we do have control over. The changes we can make ourselves. And God wants us to make those. You know, if you could summarize it all down into one little, maybe, what do I need to do? It would be this. See if this isn't right. We need to become more like Jesus Christ. Isn't that it? I want to be more like Jesus tomorrow than I am today. And at the end of this year than I am now. The Bible word for this is transformation. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. Paul says, But we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. Transformed. We're going to be transformed into the image of of our Savior. Now the Greek word there, if you don't know, is a word that gets transliterated and brought into English as the word metamorphosis. We, all, we remember those days in science class and we hated being there right in high school where they taught us about metamorphosis. That little worm goes into that cocoon and after a while comes out this beautiful butterfly that flies away. I was thinking, I was reading something on the, the news this past week about that. They were showing pictures of this in, in fast, you know, how, how it actually happened. And I'm thinking, how could you ever see that and not believe in God? I don't know how you do that. I mean, if you believe in evolution, let me ask this. At what point in the evolutionary process did this little caterpillar say, I think I'm going to spin myself a little cocoon and get in here and, and turn into a butterfly? Isn't that insane? God did that. But you see, that's, he uses this same word because that's what God's hope is for us. That we'll take this ugly person we are and become this beautiful child of God through transformation to become like Jesus Christ. Our outward selves may grow old, they may perish, but that inward part can be transformed into something far more beautiful. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 16, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet this inward man 
can be made new day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. So how does this transformation occur? What can we do to bring that about? 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18 gives us some insight. Go back and look again. He says, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed. As I'm looking into the mirror, I'm being transformed into the same image, the image of, of the Lord. So the transformation occurs as I look into the mirror. And I believe the mirror he's talking about here is, is the mirror of God's Word. It's called a mirror because it's like looking at yourself in a mirror, right? And you see all your imperfections and you see where you need to change and you see what you need to be like. Jesus Christ. James in chapter 1, verse 23 and 24, called it that mirror. He uses that same term. He calls it the Word of God there. And so as we, as we look into God's Word, as we, we dwell on that, we read about Jesus and we live how He lived in His compassion and, and His goodness and the words that He spoke and we, we live with Him day by day. We become more like Him day by day. I spent some time on Sunday, class, Sunday school class this morning trying to emphasize to folks the importance of studying the Word of God and dwelling with God's Word and reading that daily because the more you do that, the more you become like Him. It's not just that it saves us and it purifies us and it does all other things for us. It helps us become like Jesus. If I didn't know anything else, wouldn't that be enough? I would say it's more than just reading, though. It's it's living with Him. Walking day by day with Him. He that saith He abideth in Him ought Himself also to walk as He walked. 1 John 2 and verse 6. As I'm reading about Him and I'm thinking about Him and I'm meditating upon Him and I'm, I'm walking with Him in my worship, in my scripture reading, in my prayer life, in my being with the people of God, and I'm becoming more like Him. To the point that I can say, like Paul said, can you imagine being able to say this? I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. For the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Does Christ live in us? Has He made His home there? Do we walk with Him? See, that's what transformation looks like. That we become like the perfect Son of God. Paul is writing and writing to the Ephesians in chapter 4 and verse 13 and maybe a little different context but the same idea says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. There it is, coming to know God, coming to know the Son, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We grow up to be like Him. That idea, by the way, <laughs> how many of you, when you had children, had a mark on the wall when you grew up to be how high are they getting are they growing it's almost like he's saying here's the here's the mark for Jesus are you going to be like him growing up to the statue of the fullness of the son of god how are we doing are we morphing into his image paul i think gives us a little further insight into this transformation in his letter to the Romans in chapter 12. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye... Yeah, same exact word. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be transformed. <laughs> there's, 
you know, I think there's, for me at least, uh, there's some hope in that verse because he uses it as an imperative, a command. Be transformed. God never commands us to do what we can't do. So you need to be transformed into the image of the Son of God. We must be able to do that. Other translations. Don't let this world pour you into its mold. Don't let the world decide what you are going to be like, Barclay says. Don't allow yourself to live like the world around you and to follow their lifestyle because they don't care anything about being made in the image of Jesus. Don't be conformed, but be transformed into His likeness. How do you do that? Paul says, by the renewing of your mind. By changing. It really begins there, doesn't it? By changing how you think. In other words, what you really need is, Philippians 2 verse 5, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. Having the mind of Jesus. Thinking like he thought. What would he do? What would he like to do? What would he not like to do? Would he say that? Would he laugh at that joke? Would he watch that on TV? Would he go to that place? How would he treat his fellow man, his neighbor, like I'm treating them? You see, what we are and how we live our lives really begins there, doesn't it? That which cometh out of a man, that defileth a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and on and on. All these things come from within. Mark chapter 7, verses 20 and 23. So what we really need to do then is to start with our minds. Bring our thoughts. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Bring our thoughts into captivity. Well, that's, that's hard to do sometimes, right? We want to put our thoughts in jail. I'm not going to think about that anymore. I'm going to think about what he wants me to think about. I'm going to think like he would think. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 2 Corinthians 10, verses 4 and 5. So I need to start thinking like Jesus and then start acting like Jesus and to be more and more day by day like Jesus was. Of course, that requires me reading about Him, right, and living with Him. I think there's another and very important thing that, you need to, that we need to observe here. When it comes to becoming like Him and making those changes, you know, there's not a magic button there's not a pill you can take. You can't get the tablet of Al- like the tablet of Alka Seltzer and put it in the and drink. And it's not going to help. There's not any magic tricks. You can't be hypnotized. <laughs> it's not going to work. It's called effort. I think that's where we lose a lot of folks. Why is it that that person who became a Christian all those years ago, they're still no more mature than they ever were? The reason is because they don't care. They're not willing to put forth the effort to change. Go back and read all those verses that talk about the change and what's required of us. And besides this, giving all diligence, That word literally means making every effort. Mm. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 5. Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God. I mean, that may explain why so many Christians are the same as they've always been. They didn't. They didn't, ch- they didn't decide, I'm going to ch- this year I'm going to change and I'm going to be diligent at doing that. 
And all the verses talk about that, like, like exercising. Yeah, I know that's right. I know what you're thinking. No. You know, this is the end of the year, right? Time for resolutions. I'm going to lose X number of pounds. I'm going to start working out every day. And that lasts about one day. And I'm telling you, I hate exercising. You can tell, right? <laughs> we want to be like the Lord. We've got to exercise ourselves unto godliness. 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. We must press on or strain forward. Philippians 3, verse 13. We must strive. Luke 13, verse 24. We must seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. Obviously, becoming like Jesus isn't going to happen unless we work at making it happen. Unless it becomes so important to us that we're willing to put forth the effort. Let me leave you with one other thing. You know, I've, I've observed over the years, the reason that some people don't do something is because, it's not because they don't know, it's because they don't have the motivation to do it. When your heart doctor tells you, if you don't lose weight, you'll be in the grave in six months. You lose weight, don't you? So, if I want to go to heaven, <laughs> and I do, I'm going to have to be like Jesus. If I don't want to spend an eternity in you know, I've often thought, if I could just, for three seconds, experience torment, well, that'd be enough, wouldn't it? Wouldn't take three seconds. And I'd be ready to do anything. I, I see all these folks that we lost this past year, and I'm not God's, I'm not the judge, I'll leave that all up to God and everything, but they, well, they left this world without any thought of serving God. And if you could talk to them right now, what would they say? Oh, man. If I could just come back, oh, I would live so much differently. Being like Jesus would be so much more important to me. If I could just... But they, you can't come back. There's no second chances. But there's a better motivator than that, I think. And, and here it is. We, just a few moments ago, Mike gave it to us here at the Lord's table. Because I love God. The more I love God, the more I want to serve God. I want to be like God. I want to live with God. I mean, over my years of, of trying to preach and work with people, and I've come to realize that's really it. The problem is we don't love God enough. John says, for this is the love of God that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5 and verse 3. When I come to love God, I live for God. And if I'm not living for God, maybe I'm missing love for God. But you know, it's easy to love God when I think about what He did for me. He not only kept me from an eternal torment, He made possible for me to live with Him eternally in heaven, but He did it at such an incredible cost, allowing His own Son to die for me, that I might be redeemed from my sins. For as much as we know that we are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by a tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without spot, without blemish, He died for us. Isaiah 53, boy, such a beautiful passage. He bore our stripes on that cross. And it's easy to love God when we begin to think about all that He's done for us over the years and how He blesses us. Every good and perfect gift cometh down from above, from the Father of lights. James chapter 1, verse 17. I'm so thankful that he chose the word father to describe our relationship because I know what fathers, I know what a good father's like. He's a perfect father. 
He says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that, that ask him? We can cast all our care upon him because he cares for us, Peter says. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7. So many things in God's word tell us God's going to take care of us. He's going to bless us. He's going to help us. And if I look back over my life, and I'm sure you can do the same thing. Oh, how God... God has blessed me. Even those times in life when it didn't seem like He was blessing me. He was. How can we not love God that loved us so much that did so much for us that blesses us so much but if we love God like that we can't love the world we can't be conformed to the world and be conformed to his image we can't love the world and love him 1 John chapter 2 but if we love God well that's all the motivation I need I want to be like him. I want to be like his son. I want to change. I'm going to change this year for the better. We say that Denise and I were talking, I was actually kidding her a little bit about growing older. She's older than me, you know. But I was telling her, look, you, we say you're another year older. She's a year older than me. But really, it's just a day older, right? You're just a day older today than you were yesterday. So 2024, another year. By the way, I won't see you again until next year. <laughs> it's not that long. Just a few days. But for us, it signals the opportunity, another opportunity to do what we couldn't do this past year, to change, to transform, to become like Jesus. And the question is, will we use it for that? I like this poem. I'm sure you've heard it entitled A New Le Leaf by Helen Fisher. He came to my desk with a quivering lip. The lesson was done. Dear teacher, I want... A new leaf, he said. I spoiled this one. I took the old leaf stained and blotted and gave him a new one all unspotted and into his sad eyes smiled. Do better now, my child. I went to the throne with a quivering soul. The old year was done. Dear father, hast thou a new leaf for me? I have spoiled this one. He took the old leaf, stained and blotted, and gave me a new one, all unspotted. And into my sad heart smiled and said, Do better now, my child. Are we ready to turn over a new leaf to be better, to grow, to change, to become what the Lord wants us to be? The harsh reality, of course, is that we're not guaranteed a new year or even a new day. James, as he said <laughs> so very clearly, life is just like a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. What will we do with the time that God's giving us? What will another year bring? Will we be better? It's up to us. What a great way to end the new year by coming and becoming a New Testament Christian if you're not already, doing what he tells us, being baptized for the remission of our sins because we believe in him and because we want to live a different life. Or maybe some of you who have looked back on your life and you've been examining 
your life as Paul says we should do in 2 Corinthians 13. And you don't like what you're seeing there and you want to change. Can't think of a better time right now. New year, new opportunity. Time for change. If we can help you in any way, we invite you to come. While we stand and sing. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've trod. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home. Never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love. Lord, I'm coming home. I've wasted many a precious years. Now I'm coming home. I now repent with bitter tears. Lord, I'm coming home. Coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick, my heart is sore. Now I'm coming home, my strength renew, my hope restore. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam. Open wide thine arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. Be seated, please. Our closing song will be number 717, Victory in Jesus. And after this closing song, we'll have our closing prayer. And then Mike Sullivan would like to come up just to talk to us just for a minute. Number 717. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about his groaning Of his precious blood's atoning When I repented of my sins And won the victory O oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about a mansion he is built for me in glory. And I heard about the street of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and thank you for many blessings you give us each day. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us time to be here today and hear another great lesson to your word. 
Heavenly Father, be with all those that need your guiding hand at this time, all the doctors and nurses that are taking care of them. Heavenly Father, be with all those that would love to be here and just not able at this time. Heavenly Father, go with us now as we depart. It brings us back to the next point of time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the announcement's real simple. I need help. Many of you were aware of that before I stood up here. Have you noticed that all the food is gone? The pack the pulpit got un unpacked. Oh, right. Well, the pack the pulpit got unpacked, and it's all in the back of a truck right outside this door. In about three minutes, that truck's going to be outside the door by room 105 down in the basement. If we could get eight or ten people down there to help us, we could unload that in five minutes. And it's just going in classroom 105 on the tables there. It's like a long fellowship hall. We'll just bring that truck right around to the door there, and it's right next to that classroom. So we could use your help just for a few minutes. Otherwise, I'll have to take it home and eat it all myself. <laughs> okay, thank you.